All right, so I'm gonna try to talk a little bit louder and more clearly. Essentially, you have to think of the brain as a multiverse emulator. If the morphology of the brain is being selected for by the light that's hitting our eyes or whatever higher symmetry groups of light as different uh, sphere packings representing states of energy as matter uh, might come, that might come in contact with any other sensory layer of the body, um, then this morphology of the brain is the geometrical selection we've been talking about. And if if twisters are producing uh, Riemann spheres between a firewall and the event horizon, then the subplank space that Susskind talks about, where uh, the complex space would be that is creating the projection space a universe would be is the same thing as saying that a universe so you can just imagine there's a complex space here it's determined by entanglement entropies between twisters that are hitting or they haven't hit because it takes an infinite amount of time to hit the event horizon they are virtually hitting and there's a light cone here. This light cone represents all of the infinite twisters, which, because of this conformal moment, it would take an infinite amount of time for a twister to hit an event horizon. Um, the set of infinity twisters or infinite twisters within this local region. And the local region is fractal, so the light cones can get smaller or larger defined. And uh, within this, this is a three dimensional space outside of the. Um, of the black hole. We know this is a complex two-dimensional space on the event horizon. And so this Riemann sphere, which is the same thing as a Kugelblitz black hole, which if you watch the video on black holes, you can see what a Kugelblitz black hole is, is a virtual black hole. It exists in a subplank space. So this space is a subplank space between the event horizon and the firewall. And there's an infinite amount of these virtual light cones of any kind of size you can think of. And they define the positions of these Riemann spheres. These Riemann spheres, as Twister's uh, theory has shown, represent a complex projective space of hyperbolic spaces. A hyperbolic space you can think of as the conformal space. Um, I think I talked about it in another video with M. Uh, drawings from M.C. Escher. Um, it's a space like this where, in reference, no matter where you are, if you're near the edge or over here, you always feel like you're in the center. And you can go towards the edge an infinite amount, and you'll always feel like you're in the center. So you can imagine that in three dimensions, and that's a hyperbolic projection space. So the set of all of those hyperbolic projection spaces, which for the sake of imagination you can think of as inside the black hole. So there's just a bunch of universes inside this black hole. Um, they will we know that internally so fractally that they obey certain symmetry laws if you watch I'll put in the description a link to Juan Malacena's talk on the simplicity of the Higgs boson the Higgs, the Higgs field and in general uh, the symmetry groups that represent the electromagnetic uh, field and um, the, the weak uh, force um, the, field, the field theory representing the weak force. And uh, the relationships between the different uh, symmetries are actually related to sphere packing and n dimensions. But that's really clear if you watch that video. For now, just think about the fact that there's, an, there's a finite but virtually infinite amount of universes inside each black hole, representing a set, this is representing a set of Riemann spheres. So, there may be another Riemann sphere over here. 
And these are virtual because this is a conformal space. It's a conformal moment in time. Each twister that's coming in to this space takes an infinite amount of time to hit the event horizon. So these Kugelblitz black holes are a virtual field of Kugelblitz black holes that are coming in and out of existence. So the real projection space is equivalent to a set of Riemann spheres. And the brain is a second layer of recursion because inside one of these universes is a person with eyes and they are getting light and that's defining some complex space on their eye. This determines the morphology of the brain. The brain is a map of complex space, the complex space on this eye. So the problem I had now in understanding this further was the interactions between Kugelblitz black holes. So let's say there's a light cone here and it's traveling like this and it's a symmetry of this other Kugelblitz black hole. Maybe these are perpendicular along a specific axis. Um, what are the states of the Kugelblitz black hole defined by this light cone compared to this light cone? And so um, there's these ideas that there's certain geometrical objects that are dual and an object can be self-dual. So dual, dual object you can think of as an icosahedron and a dodecahedron. It just means um, the center points um, of the dodecahedron are the vertexes of the icosahedron. So one defines the other. One, um, they're uh, uh, um, just a dual relationship. So I was just thinking about the possibilities of these Kugelblitz black holes being dual and therefore representing, and, and also chiral, and therefore representing potentially um, similar kind of gauge field structure to the kind of language that's used for regular uh, particle physics. Um, and in past videos, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it, but uh, I have, um, and also Aragona has, uh, you've um, had those uh, diagrams where you show multiple points and the dynamics between them, and it was just kind of an intuitive idea. Uh, this, this one's dying. An intuitive idea uh, to have a point of divergence and convergence. So this would be divergence, this would be convergence. And uh, you'd have some kind of field where this is divergence, then it's defining an ergodic graph, basically, where any set of points are going to around this field of, of these point particles. Uh, crash back into this black hole, and any particles here are gonna, uh, are gonna crash into this white hole. So, um, and if you're somewhere in between, you're gonna diverge from here and converge to here. And so I was thinking of these as black holes and white holes, and then an extremal Planck space. So if you have a, a Planck space defined as a minimum possible area, in two dimensions, uh, there might be a virtual field, and so I was thinking of of this subplank space, which is already defined on an event horizon, as potentially something that could exist everywhere. And I I thought of that probably six or seven years ago, but I knew it was wrong because I knew it was impossible for there to be a stable, conformal space like this with sufficient energy density. Because in order to create the diffraction pattern of these. Uh, so a diffraction pattern would be like a wave where it would be defining the positions in which these uh, black holes and white holes would uh, would exist um, without having sufficient energy. So the cosmological constant shows that there is an energy density everywhere in space, but not subplank space. It's really um, between subplank spaces that this um, 
that you can define the cosmological constant. But in an event horizon, you get twister rays. So really you have this photosphere outside the firewall where you're increasing the energy of the photons and they're increasing in frequency like crazy. And eventually, uh, through the firewall, they reach a point of uh, Planck frequency. This is the actual event horizon. So in this space, this is twister space, uh, you have Planck frequency photons and the twisters in this space are what are creating the uh, light cones that Penrose defines as the Riemann spheres. So the resolution to the problem was that everywhere in space around us, there are Planck spaces that are defined um, and do have this diffraction pattern but they're not being defined in these Planck spaces. Um, it's not within the Planck spaces here that they're being defined. They're being defined in the fractal structure of um, a Hilbert curve of points of Riemann spheres, so a Riemann sphere packing in this Planck space. And so you can, you can do the same thing I was talking about with these spheres. So you can put spheres inside the spheres, put 12 of them, 12 of them inside each sphere, put a, all the 12 spheres inside a bigger sphere and make 12 more. Between the crevices you can put 12, so you can put them inside and between the crevices of the ones inside you can put 12, and the ones that are larger, so there's uh, bigger ones, there'll be more crevices between that you can put 12, and you can also put more in between, and there'll be crevices in between, and in the middle you can put more. So there's a constant packing structure this is, defines the virtual field of potential Riemann spheres. And because these are infinity twisters and they're conformal, uh, any definition of a projective space defines an instantaneous state of these Riemann spheres. And my idea was, using Susskind's graph of complexity, where it increases linearly and then stabilizes and then decreases exponentially until it, because of an entropy dip. So an entropy dip would be similar to Penrose's CCC theory when the universe is so empty that it just fluctuates like a quantum state. Basically, the universe is so empty it acts like a very small empty space, like this whole cosmological constant fluctuation of virtual particles idea. Um, but my idea was that the universe actually wants to preserve complexity. So it would probably increase linearly, be stable, increase linearly, be stable, but there's no way of distinguishing this increasing complexity to a decreasing complexity. It just appears the same if you shift, if this axis on this graph on the on the y-axis was a VSL. So this is one speed of light, C0, C1, this is another speed of light. And you can just keep going to C infinity. So the VSL is important for defining a constant increase in, in global complexity. And that's defined over this imaginary instant, which is finite, it's defined by the lifetime of the black hole, we know by Hawking radiation. So, therefore I solved the problem of thinking within these Planck spaces in our universe, in this projective space, there are fractal universes all around us, in Planck space, all around us, but they're defined in this conformal uh, space, this conformal time of the infinity twisters going through and the light cones defining the Riemann spheres through, this is the Riemann spheres, this is the light cone, and this is just an infinity twister, in, in this twister space. And the virtual field of all the possible Riemann spheres that you can think of. This is a space around a sphere. You can think of it as just a, a super thin space around the sphere that is the black hole. And they're actually, these cool with black holes appear as the Fibonacci spiral flower method because they're sub-Planck, they're virtually two-dimensional in this complex plane, they will pack according to those rules. And so there's going to be a spontaneous formation of these spiral. Uh, every single imaginary, I call it imaginary instant because it's complex time and the imaginary number is used as, uh, to define a complex plane, but um, every instant in that imaginary uh, time um, is going to define a set of uh, Riemann spheres that define a set of complex projective spaces interiorly, which is probably much larger than the amount of Riemann spheres on the surface. So the complexity is huge, it's enormous. 
if you just want to look at the limits of complexity, uh, Wikipedia page that I put on the last video, it just shows the that's Einstein talking about is the Beck is Beckenstein, is Beckenstein bound on the limits of computation, and that if you had a, a way of extracting information from a black hole so that it could produce calculations for you, it would do more enough computation to compute the state of every particle in the universe in like less, much less than a second. So you, you can think of a large sized black hole as performing an enormous amount of computation that's just unreasonable to even think about. But the important thing is that the brain, the eye and the brain, so there's light hitting the eye, and the brain is acting like a mapping of this projection space. So the same way the universes are acting like a mapping of this complex projective space and twister space, defining these Riemann spheres. So twisters making up the light that's hitting our eyes is creating a feedback loop. Obviously our brain performs an action which then determines what our eye is going to see. And then our eyes take some input that determines the morphology of our brain by creating or, or changing uh, neuronal structures, which then determines the complex actions that we're going to take and changes the input of what our eye is going to see again. So there's a recursive, there's a second layer of recursion. There's a recursion of, you can think of the black hole as an eye or the eye as a black hole, and this is creating this Riemannian sphere packing that's defining the brain. So the problem I had with all this, because uh, I still had more problems, was, well, then do our actions change the surface of the conformal black hole that we're embedded in. Uh, that was a problem that I was thinking about a few days, and uh, it seemed to me that that couldn't be true, that it would be impossible um, for a projective space to be defining the exterior space. I had a solution um, but I'll come back to it to just go by the notes that I had uh, so I don't get lost in this video. Okay. So the first way I was thinking about it is the entanglement entropy is an idea for combining relativity with quantum mechanics. So these, the twister theory coming in on the surface of the black hole takes an infinite amount of time to hit the surface. So it's entangled with a Planck space on the surface. But there's an entanglement reference frame that says whether this twister is really entangled with this point or a different point. Um, and that defines a real projective space in a specific instant, which is an infinite amount of time for the universes that are conformal. And this defines the VSL complexity. But that would mean that there's a superposition of all the possible entanglements on the surface of this black hole. And it's an instantaneous, the entire uh, set of imaginary instants is a conformal instant. Um, and this superposition of all the possible entanglement entropy reference frames is prepared for all possible decisions. So it's prepared for all the possible internal states, projective internal states that could form. And so the way that I, I think I solved that problem with the whole, how will, aren't we changing the surface of the black hole, is actually that it has to preserve information. So the reason that it has to be prepared for all the possible internal states is because that's the only mathematical way that it could evolve dynamically. It has to be able to preserve all of the information that's in falling and all of the information that it's projecting. That's the only way to increase the complexity. And so uh, this is probably a l linear once you graph it uh, um, against the VSL. But uh, that actually comes from the idea of reduction. So you're reducing uh, this imaginary time into imaginary instants. So an imaginary instant is the same thing as Penrose and Hameroff's O-Ork theory idea of reductions of quantum coherence in the brain. 
and this is just an idea of preserving information. It's the same idea for consciousness. Consciousness is just trying to preserve information. And that's because it's just the path of least action for it to be able to preserve complexity. All right, so. Then I was thinking, so what if you're looking into someone else's eyes and there's a recursive feedback loop between your eyes and their eyes, so uh, the com your complex space is affecting their complex space and of course the uh, real projection space or mapping of the complex space on the eyes, which is the morphology of the brain. In that case, it would be a lot like having two black holes with an infinity twister between them. And this uh, kind of made me think of Hawking radiation, and I'm thinking of defining it in terms of entropy, uh, because that was the best way that Hawking was able to define his Hawking radiation was through the surface entropy and temperature of uh, a black hole. So it's something like the area proportional to the area times the speed of light cubed over four times the gravitational constant h bar. And so this idea I had before that we were both lux and lumen, we are the light and the receptor for, for light. We're a feedback loop for consciousness. I mean, if you want to talk about consciousness as computational complexity, it's integrated information networks, there's nothing more complicated or any, more of an integrated information network than a black hole. But does it cohere? And that, that's kind of what consciousness is. Does, does it cohere or reduce into these imaginary instants, this conformal space that's already itself an imaginary instant? I don't think it really does. And that's why you need a second layer of recursion in the projective space to create a pseudo-complex space. Because there is quantum coherence in our brain that does this reduction. Um, and I think that reduction has to do with actually controlling complexity so that it's not constantly increasing. It probably has to do with your packing of cells. Um, Eric Weinstein has a podcast with his brother, which I can also put in the link where he basically explains the inevitability of cancer. That's actually a product of the way the telomeres divide, um, when they uh, uh, produce the next layer of uh, cell division in whatever part of the body they're enacting upon, uh, there's a fundamental property of the way cells divide. That means by mere fact of recursion, the body is optimized to give you the most amount of time without cancer because that's the only um, because that's the only but inevitably kill you because that's the only way to keep you alive that long without cancer any other strategy would give you cancer sooner um, and so in the same way the brain it probably has to do these reductions because it's the only way to reduce complexity to prevent cohomologies which would essentially be representative of cancer Okay, and so in the writings that I have with Aragona, I was talk. I have written a little bit about the equivalence of nodal networks, and I talk about Feynman diagrams, Adinkras, uh, tensor networks, um, ergodic graphs, many different uh, kinds of nodal graphs. And essentially, I mentioned uh, in the most recent uh, edit that all nodal graphs can be made equivalent to a nodal graph of Riemannian spheres, Riemannian sphere packing. Uh, there's no Kugelblitz or Riemannian spheres, really you can just think of them as Kugelblitz black holes, virtual black holes in the subplank space of, um, of the event horizon of a black hole, these points that make up the Fibonacci spiral flower method on any sphere, uh, which I can also include the paper to that if you want to know why I mentioned that, but really just has to do with 
the way sphere packing works if you if you if you uh, looked at that. All right. The last thing I was going to mention is uh, topological knotting. So you know that uh, our sensory systems tend to be antichiral. That's because it's actually useful for them to be dual or self-dual, our, our body to be self-dual, um, to preserve symmetries. So our ears are chiral, our, our hands are chiral, our feet are chiral. I'm pretty sure uh, the lobes of our brain are probably chiral and certain subregions of the brain are probably chiral. But because of the dynamical sphere packing and error code correction, I'm sure not all of it is, is perfectly chiral or perfectly symmetric. Um, but I was thinking of how we might think of the left and right eye as chiral. And aside from um, maybe the slant of the areas surrounding the eye, um, I can only really think of the complex space as being chiral. And so there's probably chiral Kugelblitz black holes. Um, that are defined by the way they evolved over imaginary instants to produce topological knotting. Um, if you, um, on the last video, I put a video of the description of Ed Witten talking about topological knotting in physics and how unreasonable physics was at actually explaining topological knotting as if it was more fundamental. Um, so that's another one that you should reference. So the eyes work as a sergotic graph. The eyes can be thought of as a space mapping, sphere packing. Because the real space inside of a black hole, the real projective space, are these hyperbolic spaces. And they're defined by twisters, which are essentially just lights. Then every black hole is defined at some scale to be a Kugelblitz black hole in a virtual particle field of a subplank space of an event horizon. Um, it could be that that's wrong and that fundamentally m massless virtual black holes or Kugelblitz black holes are different than, than mass-based black holes, um, but I don't think so. I think that as the temperature of a black hole increases proportional, inversely proportional to its area, or the entropy in increases proportionally, that it will reach a point where this black hole shrinks into a conformal space of a, of a Planck volume. The Planck area will be within the balance of the Planck volume. And that's when the CCC entropy dip will occur and it'll actually become the lowest temperature, most ordered object in that sub-Planck space, defining, which actually defines, like I was saying earlier, a different projection, a different scale of the Ramanian spheres into real space. So there's this relationship between the idea that I had a long time ago and this other idea I had about black holes converging into conformal spaces. And maybe in this space, the big balance is correct and it does reflect, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't also conf become conformal to the space. The information could become conformal and uh, that would preserve complexity and the matter itself could bounce and create another big bang. And there are models that think of it that way as well, but there should be a relationship, I think, between uh, a fractal multiverse that we would consider in our real projective space to be all around us and the complex projective space of the Riemann spheres in the subplank twister space. So you think you really have to watch the videos by Penrose to see that this idea is plausible within those ideas.
it is convenient to think of it as a coolable black hole because that makes it familiar to structures that already exist in nature. If you only think of it in terms of a Riemann sphere, then we can't define uh, a fractal system. So, currently I'm thinking in terms of entropy. So we have some projective space inside this black hole that's, con that's surrounding our universe, we're conformal to. And we have an internal hyperbolic space, which is equivalent essentially to a black hole as well. This is a fractal projection of a uh, Riemann sphere within the subplank space. And the set of possible Riemanns uh, of uh, hyperbolic spaces are, uh, represents maybe just one Riemann sphere. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But the entropy defining the state of matter in our universe, that uh, things become more disordered over time, is a measure of a dynamical evolution of the Riemann sphere in twister space. So it's a measure of the representation of the local sphere packing. There may be areas where entropy is constantly decreasing within the real projective space. Or it could be that all the possible local dynamics of Riemann sphere packing that would be correspondent to a decrease in entropy are divergent and don't have solutions in real projective space. space. In that case, you could only ever have hyperbolic real projection solutions in which entropy is increasing. And the only areas where entropy would decrease in these universes is when black holes evaporate because they're proportional to their area and their areas will decrease as they evaporate. So the balance between the constant increase in entropy in any of these universes is done by the black holes decreasing the entropy. The trade-off is that it has to increase in temperature and that's because it's preserving complexity within this twister space. So I think it only makes sense for it to become conformal to a Planck area or Planck volume and preserve that information potentially with a bounce and therefore preserve complexity and invert in terms of temperature. And that would be consistent with an adiabatic principle over Planck spaces in the real projective space. And then this conformal Planck space would be the same as the conformal Planck space of the event horizon determining the Riemann spheres, which I thought of as Kugelblitz black holes and potentially white holes, uh, and this kind of gradient field of convergence and divergence. So in the CCC model, the entire universe essentially behaves like a Planck space, it could be that because the universe has to be hyperbolic and there has to be an increase in entropy, that to be within the real, project real projection space, it could be that there can only ever be within what would be defined as a limit on the cosmological constant which may actually be a cosmological gradient that's decreasing, where it's sufficiently empty to behave like a quantum mechanical state, and where the black hole suddenly fluctuates and becomes conformal to this newly defined Planck space, which could be enormous. It could be many, many, many times larger than our universe. So I can also put a video in the description of uh, 
a video that talks about the very distant future and the evolution of, of our universe based on the current understanding of cosmology. And it's fairly certain that our time in the universe is less, much, much less than a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a percent, much less than that of the age of the universe. Most of the universe is going to be black holes evaporating and space expanding. And that could be defined by this uh, conformal twister space uh, imaginary instance. And it could be that each universe has a different timer. Or it could be that there's just a general limit on this defined by the evolution of the twister states or the imaginary instance. Um, but in any case, the black hole that would be bounded to this conformal Planck space, if this entire, if the space around the black hole is expanding indefinitely, and you get many, many times the volume of our universe to create a Planck space, then it's not so much that this black hole is shrinking into a conformal Planck space, but the space around it is expanding into a conformal Planck space. In that case, it just immediately becomes conformal to that Planck space.